he took an, an EKG, an electrocardiogram of my heart, and knew immediately that I was in really dire condition. I couldn't even move my heel of my foot off of the bed. I was not in control of my body. That really bothered me a lot. Well, I grew up in New Jersey, uh, northern Jersey. I was perfectly healthy as a child. Um, never had anything, never had stitches, never broke a bone. We had a summer rec program in our town, and she ran a couple races, and I guess that's when we all figured out that she was a pretty fast runner. She went through four years of high school and very rarely lost a race. I was quite good at, at sprinting. Um, went to what's called the state uh, meet of champions every year, so I was one of the top ten in the state. In 1997, I was um, a newspaper reporter at a small weekly paper in, on the coast of Maine. She just contracted the flu like anybody would in the winter time. Tuesday night into Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I, I really couldn't eat anything. I said, Daylin, if you're not any better. By tomorrow, you've got to go to the emergency room. Which they did the next day. And from that point on, it was all downhill. And so when she came to us at Brigham and Women's, she had been in the medical system for about 24 hours, and it was already clear that she had a very, very serious heart condition, that she, in fact, was dying of a virus infection. Viral myocarditis is um, an idiopathic um, virus that affects um, the heart. They don't know where they, it comes from. They don't know why it would affect just her heart. They did not know if she was going to make it. In the elevator, I went into cardiac arrest. And when that happens, most people die. And there was no solution that would save her life except mechanical support. Her heart was so weak that her entire body was failing. In fact, during the three weeks she was on the heart bypass, the heart-lung machine, uh, we almost lost her a couple of times. It seemed every time they spoke to us, it was not good news. It was bad news. She didn't want to sleep because um, she was afraid that she won't wake up when she falls asleep. I've, you know, always eaten well, exercised, and kept my body in good shape, and, and done everything right. So why would something like this happen to me? 25 still is very young to be faced with death. My wife and I got very little sleep, couldn't eat. We were just totally frightened every minute of every day, hoping that she gets a heart because we knew she would not survive without one. Several people pass away a day waiting on the heart transplant waiting list. In her case, she was extremely fortunate. A donor organ became available within a very short period of time. My sister was the kind of person who tried to help people. She was a very kind and, and, uh, and caring kind of person. And I thought this would be something that, that she would want us to do. From what I know about her, she seemed to be a beautiful person and somebody I probably would have been friends with. Surgery must have taken about three hours. It was routine, if you will. We knew that we were facing a danger for her of a very high risk of bleeding. And she actually had to undergo several uh, specialized treatments to try to control the risk of bleeding before and during the operation. Just to see her and touch her was wonderful. And of course she didn't know she had a heart transplant, um, so we had that to face to tell her. But the first memory I do recall is um, the fact that I couldn't move my legs. She looked like she came out of a concentration camp. She was skin and bones. And from that point on, I knew it would take a long time to get her back. She couldn't do anything. She was so weak, she couldn't take a shower. She, she couldn't get dressed by herself. We worried for some time that she might not ever have a full recovery of her muscle strength because of how ill she had been. It took one week of isometric exercise, just flexing her legs back and forth to get her to lift her foot off the bed one inch. Here is a girl who was very confident her whole life, and she lost everything. She turned around, she looked at me, and she said, I want to walk to you. She took two steps, 
walked over to me, grabbed her arms around me, just started crying. And just a lot of love and, and, and I don't know, just good energy coming, you know, into my room every day. And from that point on, we started letting her walk on her own. And she just got stronger and stronger. And then we knew she was coming back. I really wanted to try, try running. Um, it was difficult because my legs were so thin and my knees would buckle. I would walk and just collapse. She knew I had run the marathon before and she said, do you think I could run again? And I said, yeah, you know, you just take it slow. She wanted to, to show everyone that you could be the same person, if not better, before transplant as after. I wrote a letter to them. Um, about eight, it took me eight months, and I'm a writer, and it took me eight months to write it. It was the most difficult thing I've ever written. Um, just thanking, because thanking them. Thank you just doesn't seem like enough. In a last ditch effort to save my life, doctors transplanted the heart of a 39-year-old. In a sublime act of generosity and grace, her family agreed to offer a precious and singular gift to a total stranger. The New England Donor Bank has a uh, gathering for all the donor families, so they invited my daughter and a few other transplant recipients, and these recipients would talk to the donor families and tell them how appreciative they are for what they've done. When the uh, mother of the donor saw my daughter, she just put her arms around her and hugged her like she was hugging her own daughter. That was the first thing she did because she wanted to feel Jane's heart. Part of her daughter was in there and that's all she wanted to do. They have confidence that I will always take good care of their daughter's heart. And, and, and once I knew that and once I looked into their eyes, I just, you know, I just felt instantly better and just much better about everything. She was up speaking to the group and for some reason it came out of her mouth. That was when I actually announced publicly that I was going to run the marathon. Many of our patients who have heart transplants return to a normal functional lifestyle. That is one thing. It's quite another matter to consider undertaking a physical challenge of the magnitude of the Boston Marathon. And I knew that I had to do it not only for myself but for Jane, for the hospital, for everybody watching. The word was out <laughs> that we were going to do this, and, and um, we knew we had to do a good job, so. <laughs> and we're not moving. <laughs> I didn't have a lot of time to be nervous because there was just so much going on and stuff. You know, all the great people are in the front. We were way in the back, way in the back, because we were running for charity. Um, all the money um, that we raised for Team Brigham went to the Heart Hope Fund in the hospital. We just had so much motivation and, and we just kind of kept going. We didn't, I didn't stop once for the 26.2 miles, I didn't stop once. People are in Boston are just lying in the streets and, and it was six hours, almost six hours after the start of the marathon, which is at noon. And um, a lot of people were still there because um, they knew about me. When we got to the final stretch and everybody was still there cheering because they knew that you know, I was going to come down the chute, that I started to run. She is the first women's heart transplant. It was a great moment. It really was a great moment. And everything came together that day. It was the most exciting day, I think, that I have ever experienced with a patient. And I ran across the barrier as soon as I could and gave her a big hug. I just got hugged and hugged and hugged. And Jane was in my thoughts the whole time. Um, because certainly without her, I wouldn't be able to do it. Kim, Jane's sister, her elder sister, flew in to meet me for the first time. She knew that her sister ran in the marathon too, and that made her feel really good. And seeing her eyes and seeing her smile and knowing that she just was pleased, just was happy, and um, you know, that, that made me feel really satisfying. She's one of my role models, considering what she's gone through how she's lifted herself off the ground. She's really taken the uh, role of role model quite seriously. She gives talks, speeches, and presentations uh, virtually on request uh, anywhere in the country. It's taken time and many revolutions of why me, but the lesson I've learned is this, every day you're alive is a special occasion. 
I don't even think of this as my own heart yet. I think of it as her heart, and I think I always will think of it as her heart. Um, I'm just borrowing it, and, and it's allowed me life. <laughs>